So let's read, write those verses now from chapter 4, verse 2, to the end of the epistle. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, and to the end of the epistle. Continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all, praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walking in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who's one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive them. And Jesus, or Joshua, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. God bless to us what we have read and the epistles that we, the portions of this epistle that we've read night by night. Are you going to be able to say, now there is no final exam to this particular study week. What a pity. I would just love to give another final exam to people. Well, you've done better than most of my students ever did. So far, we have about a 98.9% .9 awake rate. And so that's good. And the other little bit, well, they needed it badly. And so we'll just talk softly for them. But we just admire very much your diligence. If someone were to come to you and say, so what's the letter of Colossians about? Could you answer the question? Oh, you say, well, I've been listening all week and, uh, well, I, well, I, I, well, I could, well, well, did you notice our brother tonight in opening? He at least has read the first eight or nine verses. I got that. And that was a great, that's a great start. I know he knows a whole lot more. He was just, he was giving you a wee hint, you know, like at the teacher standing at the board and say, if you're having trouble with question 38, here's a wee hint. Actually, they do they say we in this country? Good. Amen. We'll say it in heaven, I'm sure. Well, there'll be nothing we there, I can guarantee you. Well, he's given you a little hint there. He says, Paul is so pleased because there's people who have faith and they have love and they have hope. They received it in the gospel. They've believed it. And now Paul is writing to them and saying, I want you to know Christ and know that he's absolutely, totally sufficient not only for your salvation, but your spiritual maturity. Oh, that you will know him, that you will grow in him, and that you will show that he is indeed your Lord and master. And we just declared that, well, we just want you to know his greatness, the discernment of his greatness. So that's what we want you to remember. At the very beginning, there's people that know he's great. And then Paul says, let's declare his greatness. Let's declare his greatness. And that took us, that took us, didn't it, into the last half of chapter one. Who is by him? He is. He is. And it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. 
Oh, he's great. I'll tell you, he says, he's great, but he's done great things for you. And Paul goes on to say, not only has he done great things for you, but he says, I've got a role in it too. And, uh, and I'm going to just go about and declare his greatness. So discern his greatness, declare his greatness. And then he says, and I'm going to guard you. Chapter two is all about guarding. Let no man beguile you. There's going to be people coming around and they're going to try to tell you that Christ isn't good enough. He says, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. There's going to be people that are going to come and say, oh, it's good that you have Christ, but you need this too. Anything added to Christ, you're saying he's not good enough. So don't be trying to be more saved by doing laws or, or worshiping angels, he says. And there's all these pagan things out there and Judaism is out there and it's all mixed up. He says, listen, let's just cut away the waffle and just blow away the chaff. He says, we want the kernel of the matter and the kernel of it is Christ. He says, and that's, that's all you need. You're complete in him. In fact, if you just want to, if someone says, what's Colossians all about? Just think C, Colossians, C, complete. Okay? Like, I can't make it any simpler than that. So there's your final exam. One question. What is the word, what is the phrase that describes Colossians? Complete in him. Worship his majesty. Ponder him. Think on him discernment of his greatness oh we want that declaration of his greatness we want to hear that and defense of his greatness don't let anyone say anything against this one and say you need to add in we don't want those legal boys coming in do we we don't want legalism and we don't want people coming in and saying i can live whatever way you want because the next half of the book is all about that he says if you're going to be truly devoted to his greatness you're going to seek to radiate that new life you have in him. Be gone with the old life. Put on the new. How'd you get dressed this morning, brethren? Sisters, I know there was nothing in the cupboard for your the wardrobe to wear. I know that. We established that. And it's time your husband did something about it and went out there and bought you all sorts of things to put in the spare bedroom because you've no more room left in the main one, right? Well, what do I know about marriage? Hardly anything. So moving on swiftly. Devoted to his greatness is what we had there heading into chapter three. And then I use that little word deference to his greatness. What I was really meaning is if you have an idea of how great he is, you'll get along a whole lot better. You'll submit one to another because, you know, it really doesn't matter about you. It all matters about him. All matters about him. Do you ever notice that little things that might bother you on regular days? Well, whenever, whenever something big is happening that day, you're not going to let the little things bother you. Now, I, I do remember our whole family looking stunned. We were boys and girls, and two boys, two girls, looking at my father. We were just so amazed because he was a very particular chap. He liked to keep things nice and in order and so on. And he had, uh, he had a, I think it was a pair of binoculars. And we were coming in from Canada and we were coming in on the boat into the Belfast Loch. Now he grew up in Northern Ireland. For us, it was a holiday. For him, it was coming home. And the lens caps off of these binoculars as he was fumbling to see if he could see his parents on the, on the dock and he's looking carefully. The lens caps fell out of his pocket, bounced on the deck and off into the sea. And we all went, uh-oh. But because it was so great an occasion, he didn't care. It mattered far more of the loved ones on the shore than the lens caps in the loch. And that taught me a lesson that day. We make a whole big ado about nothing. When we really should be just recognizing he's so great. And maybe that will just wean us away from all of these little things. We're just going to give deference to his greatness. 
that'll show up in how we treat our husbands and wives and fathers and children and the employers and employees and that. And, uh, and well, you brethren that are in business, you know all about that. It's not so easy. Well, you just remember you serve the Lord Christ and you employers, you remember you're a bond servant, not a master in his eyes. So then we come to what our passage was tonight. I just call this dedication to his greatness. We're going to study in a moment the names of 12. I had to slip Barnabas in there to get 12 because the preachers, you can't preach and say there's 11. I mean, that sounds like there's something missing. So I quickly scoured the passage again and oh, it will include Barnabas, even though he's not really in it. He's just a little reference, but there's going to be 12 men and I'm just going to call that dedication to his greatness. But just from verse two down to verse six, there's a little passage here and it, I'll just call it Paul's prescription for proclaiming the greatness of Christ. This is a great little passage to read before you have gospel meetings. It's a great passage just to remind yourself that even the great apostle, he says, we can't do this unless we're connected with headquarters. We can't do this unless we're in tune with heaven. He says, here's what I want you to look at. Verse two, I want you to plead persistently. Verse three, I want you to petition particularly. Oh, this is good. Listen to this. Now, verse four, I want you to preach properly. Verse five, I want you to proceed prudently. And verse six, persuade profitably. I just got 10 Ps in a row. I worked on that. I hope you like that. Now let's go back and learn what that actually meant. Okay. There's no point getting your preaching papers in Ps and Qs if you can't then say what it actually means. So look at it. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. He says, I want you to recognize the greatness of Christ and to be dedicated to him. We touched this quite a bit this morning about Samson as he began to pray. And we talked about our prayer life, but let's just never, never, ever, ever. Should we ever devalue the prayer meeting? I know, I know that Mr. Paisley used to call it the powerhouse of the meetings. That's Mr. Harold Paisley. And so as he would come along and he would have, he'd have the room in there. He would always make sure, get as many into the prayer meeting. I know Mr. Spurgeon was the same. I never met him personally, but he was the same. And he always wanted there to be the prayer meeting. And I tried to sometimes ask myself, do I really value the prayer meeting? And I do remember the Vancouver tent in 1991 and another one, 1992. They set it up in the middle of the stadium. Oh, the stadium was condemned. The empire, it was uh, where the empire games were held in Vancouver. They put the, the, the tent right in the middle of the stadium. You should have seen the papers on the big sports page. Christians pray where the lions roared. You see, it was the lions. That was the name of the football team. Okay. And so there we were, but we set up a tent beside it. It only seated about a hundred. That was the prayer meeting tent. And what went on in that tent there seemed to have a great deal of measure with what went on in the big tent. Don't miss the prayer meeting. We've all got commitments and this and the family commitments and work commitments and every kind of commitment. But whatever happened to the prayer meeting commitment? Whatever happened to that one? He says, I want you to plead persistently that we might be able, because one of his goals is to warn every man, teach every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so we're pleading persistently. Well, that's a good start to the gospel series. Then he says, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. He says, I want you to petition particularly, not just plead persistently, but petition particularly. I'm sure that there's many here and you would be like one young fellow that I know. And underneath one of the trays on his desk, he's got a whole list of names. He's got a whole list of names. They're to be prayed for. Lord, bless everyone everywhere in all places where all servants are preaching the mighty gospel in every place of the world. Amen. Now get down to business. Petition particularly. 
And in particular, ask God the, for the preacher to have help. The devil doesn't want any help going on there. The devil doesn't want the great mystery of Christ to be unfolded properly. You pray that the you pray that a door of utterance will be opened. You pray, he says, for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. That's what he's saying. You pray for me. He's the great apostle. You say he's in touch with heaven, but he's saying, I want you to stand by me and I want you to petition that I might be able to have a door of utterance. I want to speak it right. I want the opportunities. I want things to be opened. And so we can pray and specifically lay it out. Now be wise, of course, be wise. If it's a very public prayer meeting, you want to be careful. I understand but it wouldn't be the first person that was shook to the core, shaken to the core when they heard their name mentioned in a prayer meeting. Wouldn't be the first person. So when you're praying, you ask God to touch that man there. And you ask God to touch that woman there. And you ask God to help the preacher. You ask God for your opportunities to come in. A door of utterance. Do you ever pray that? A door of utterance. If Christ is so great, we should be seeking help to have those doors of utterance. And then he says, and, and look, he says, I, I want to preach properly. Verse four, as I ought to speak, <laughs> preach properly. So it's not only that you would have these, these opportunities given to you, that when I have them, that I may make this mystery manifest as I ought to speak. I don't think it would ever happen in this country, but sometimes brethren will be, they're listening. Elder brethren, no doubt, will be listening. I uh, hope it does happen in this country. Then, And they listen to the gospel being preached. And they'll say to themselves, that was weak. All he was doing was just telling people to give their hearts to Jesus. That's a bit weak. Where was sin? Where was the greatness of Christ? Where was repentance? When we preach the gospel, it's a serious business. And we want to be able to preach properly. A full gospel every time. Now, I would understand there's different emphasis, especially if you're speaking for nine weeks. You're allowed to concentrate now and then on one or two things on, on a particular night. You would know that. But here's the thing. There's been too many people in my experience that have only ever heard one gospel meeting. They have come in. They have listened. They've gone out and you read in the papers, they're dead. So we do want to pre preach properly. Paul wants that. And then he says to all of them, he says, now I want you to proceed prudently. This, this, we don't want to mess this up. This is, this is so, this is such a great message. You need to walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. So we're using up opportunities and we're walking in wisdom. We want to proceed prudently. We're not crazy. We just happen to have it right. We, we've got the gospel. We've got Christ. So we're not going to cheapen it with gimmicks. We're not going to cheapen it with our silly behavior and mixing the gospel. By all means, jump in the pool when you want to. But I'm talking about whenever you're going to be preaching the gospel, make sure those people know. That this is a serious business that we're, uh, we're undertaking. And we want to just be wise. Sometimes you have to keep your mouth shut. Sometimes, especially if you're getting blasted. Have you ever got blasted? I don't mean by friends or relatives or whatever. That's just normal. I'm talking about when you're going door to door. And you get blasted. You need a wee bit of wisdom, don't you? Actually, you need the patience of Job. To be, and the wisdom of Solomon. I was about to say on the children of Israel, but it doesn't fit in this case. But uh, you, you need wisdom. And so he says, you walk in wisdom. And then he says, now, look, you persuade profitably. He says, when you're speaking about this great message, your speech should always be with grace, seasoned with salt. It doesn't say the whole bag of salt. It just says, you need to know how you ought to answer every man. In other words, be very gracious, but still be direct. This is, Christ is so great and the gospel is so marvelous that Paul says, I need to preach properly, but you need to speak properly. And so when you're inviting people to come, I know you're very good at it. 
And that's great. Keep it up. But we also have to remember, we're not just trying to be friends with everybody. We have a message that tells them that the ship is going down and we know the, oh, we know the pilot of the lifeboat. But the ship's still going down. It's not a time to be playing. Not a time to be playing on the deck. Not a time to be rearranging the chairs. Not a time to be tuning the musical instruments. It's a time to get people out of this wicked world going down to hell. But he says, just season it with salt. Um, anyone who's done any bit of cooking, I think our brother Howard McCracken and I are well expert in cooking and know our way around the, around the kitchen very, very well. He's been in it once, he told me, and he has peeled a potato. And I want you to congratulate him at the end of this meeting for that. I think it was in 1963. Anyway, we'll leave that. I do know this, that you don't add in a cup of salt. Don't ever get the salt and the sugar mixed up. We season with salt. So you don't want to be a salty talker constantly, just being so hard. And someone comes and you turn on them immediately. That's not the point. Just, just be gracious. Season it with salt. Oh, the Lord knew exactly how to do it, didn't he? The harlots and the publicans came and sat at his feet in repentance. Yet he certainly knew how to speak a word to those that were hypocrites. Oh, that we might be given. So there's, there's a little prescription for proclaiming the greatness of Christ in those few verses. Now let's go to these companions that were dedicated. Paul's companions that were dedicated to the greatness of Christ. And so you can see here right away that this, is a, this reads a little bit like David's mighty men. It reads a little bit... Um, like Hebrews 11, it, these, are, these are people and there's little things said about them and the names all come up. Can I just say that I'm surprised that all these names are here in such a short letter? It's very surprising to me. I, I might expect it to be the last chapter of Romans. That was a great treatise concerning the gospel. And it was just, and so an extra chapter after you've had 15 big chapters, an extra chapter on naming various people in the churches and so on, that just seemed like that fits. And then maybe you get a little bit in 1 Corinthians, none in, none in 2 Corinthians, no names ending Galatians. You've got the, maybe Tychicus is the only one you have here in Ephesians, not really anything much in Philippians. It, there's an abnormally long list in Colossians. That's what I'm trying to say. A whole section. You say, what's this about? Well, I do think it's linked with the greatness of Christ in a lovely way. There's coming a day, brethren and sisters, when we will stand before him. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And there will be many a person Standing before him. And as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, we are going to receive that reward, the things that are done in our body, whether good or bad. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is, this is a mini judgment seat, I suggest to you. Oh, he's so great. He has every, he has every reason to, to acknowledge those that are just proclaiming his greatness, helping to forward his greatness and so I just find it a lovely thing that one so great. And now here's a 12 names that are linked with his greatness. You would know that there's many more, many, many more could be said. Many, many more could be added. Just like it seems to me that the, the, uh, the long list of the honor roll of faith in Hebrews 11. It seems to me that there's room for more names. Yours. I call that an unfinished chapter. It seems to me that when you come to the book of the Acts, that it ends so abruptly. I call that the unfinished book. And if you really want to know the end of the book of John, John's gospel, he says, actually, if I was to continue to write on my subject, he says the very world itself could not contain the books that are meant to be written and could be written, should be written. There's an inexhaustible subject. And so there's things that are still in the Bible. I dare say when you see a long list, you should sometimes ask yourself, would I be there? Could I be there? 
So as we go down them, I trust that you'll see that this is like a, this is like a little preview to when the great day comes, that there might be a, uh, you're standing before the judgment seat and you'll see what's important. So let's look at it, shall we? And we'll just bring our, con- our uh, remarks to a conclusion with these 12 men. Tychicus, verse 7 and 8. And Onesimus, verse 9. These two, he says, will make known unto you all the things done here. But look what it says. Look what it says in Tychic, about Tychicus. It just, it calls him a beloved brother. Beloved brother. Well, what a lovely title. You know, some of us here all have different titles, don't we? We've got worldly titles. I don't know. Some of you could be captain or whatever. I don't know. But some might be doctor or professor or whatever it does. But you know, there's one title that must be the highest of them all. And that's why, can I tell you, we be in my bonnet. When you're writing a letter of commendation, could you just call him brother or sister? Rather than he is a tank commander or something. What You know, I don't know what the... I, I just, that's just my wee thing. And I think I'm allowed to say that. I think I'm allowed to say that. Brother, beloved. Every one of you. Brethren and sisters. Brother, beloved. Delightful title when it comes to Tychicus here. Faithful minister. That's our word deacon, isn't it? He's a faithful servant. So the brother, beloved. A faithful servant. And it says, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Oh, Paul had a great appreciation for Tychicus. He was a man that you could just say, he's my beloved brother. He's a man who was very faithful in his service when it came to the word. And he's a fellow servant in the Lord. He stood by me. Those are the kind of, those are the kind of people that Paul was deeply appreciating People you could love, people you could note were good workers, and people that would stand by you in the Lord. He says, I'm going to send him to you. In fact, Tychicus might very well have carried Colossians. I'm going to suggest to you Colossians and the little book of Philemon. Those two books were carried together by not only Tychicus, but Onesimus. We don't have time to go into Philemon, but it was all about Onesimus being sent back. And look what they say about Onesimus. He was a rascal. He was a man who who ran away from his master. He's a man, you would say, Onesimus, unfaithful. What is he called? A faithful and a beloved brother. He's one of you. They're going to tell you the things which are done here. You can just feel the warmth of it, can't you? It's great to be able to speak about our brethren and sisters with a certain warmth. Well, that's what Paul was able to do. And then he says, Aristarchus. Aristarchus, what about him? Well, you can read about him in other places. Aristarchus knew what it was to uh, knew what it was to be caught up in a riot. In the Ephesian riot, they grabbed Aristarchus, didn't they? And Gaius, and they dragged them into the theater. You say, well, he's he certainly he certainly knows what it is to proclaim the greatness of Christ and suffer for it. He actually was on the shipwreck. As far as I can see, unless he got off the boat somewhere along the line before the ship was wrecked, he, he got on board. He's with Paul. He, this is a man. This is a man that goes through all the different various circumstances. Was he a good preacher? I don't know. I don't know. Was he gifted? I don't know. All I know is that he's called, he's a fellow prisoner. Fellow prisoner. How Paul must have been delighted that... Uh, There was one when I was in prison. I don't know if he was thrown in prison or whether he was coming and visiting in prison. You would know that people could come and stay with Paul at times and and refresh him. Well, Aristarchus was that kind of a man. He was there when the chips were down. He was there when the ship was down. He was there when the riots were happening. He was there when people were getting pummeled. You say, this man's always there. It's great to have people like that. You know, God will mark people who are there. When I read Matthew chapter 25, and he says, I'm going to reward you because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you you helped me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Lord, when did we do that? He says, when you did it, even unto the least of these, my brethren. 
you did it unto me. So brethren and sisters, I just wonder if you would be an Aristarchus, that no matter what happens, whether it's the fists that are flying or the waves that are pounding, I wonder if you will just be there. That's called faithfulness. And that's what I love about Aristarchus. He says, my fellow prisoner. Marcus. What about Marcus? Ah, oh, yes. Sister's son. That might just be another expression for cousin to Barnabas. And I don't need to say much about Barnabas, but Barnabas was very good at encouraging people. He was very good. It would seem to, in fact, I'm going to suggest to you, it might be because of Barnabas's care for Mark, that Mark was actually restored. You will remember that Paul and Barnabas had a bit of a set too. They had a difference of opinion. It was a bit sharp, actually. And Paul takes Silas, and off he goes to, to visit all the assemblies. And Barnabas, he takes Mark, and he goes off to Cyprus. Now, just stop for a moment. It must not have been all that bad. We can make a lot of it. It must not have been all that bad because we didn't get a whole sectarian division over it. We didn't get the church of the Paulites and the church of the Barnabasites. As far as we can see, they just kept on preaching the gospel. They may not have got along, but they kept on preaching the gospel. I think Paul wanted to preserve the work, so he didn't want Mark. You see, Mark? You know what happened to Mark? He remembered his mother's cooking whenever he was going into Asia and he hightailed it back for home. That was half made up. He did hightail it back for home. I don't know the reason, but it might've been getting a bit on his nerves. He was a good Jew and he was moving through Gentile territory. I don't know, but it just says he departed from them. You don't want any of those kind of fellows in the work. So Paul says, we're not taking him again. He's a quitter. Barnabas looks at him and says, I'm going to take him so he can be restored. I'm going to take him so that he can make something of him. I'm, you know, I'm going to be a good Canadian. Paul and Barnabas were both right. One was thinking of the work and the other was thinking of the man. And, you know, we need both of those kind of, we need both of those kind of actions. We do need to preserve the work, but we also need to remember the man. Well, what I love about the tracing for Mark, while he departed here, Paul is saying, if he does come to you, you put him in the back seat and make him squirm. And if you do receive him, don't let him on that platform. And if you do, you know how it is. We have all these degrees, like the way David dealt with Absalom. We have all these different degrees and we're going, well, you just be very careful, says Paul. There seems to be a measure of restoration in that man. He says, I've commanded you if he comes to you, receive him. That must have been a, that must have been a, a great thing to know. That Mark, who once departed, is now by apostolic authority and command from Paul, he, assemblies are to receive him. Something must have happened. I think Barnabas had something to do with it. This cousin of Barnabas. Well, do you know what I love about 2 Timothy in chapter 4 where it says about Mark? He's profitable. He's profitable. Do you know that some of the failures that might have left Perth? When they come back with the right attitude and the right spirit and you check into everything I know and you receive them, there could be a day coming when you'll just say, you know, that brother's profitable. It's a real help here. It only happens if they have a true change of heart, you know. It only happens if they truly repent. Well, there's something in the story of Marcus that just, of Mark here, that, uh, that just touches us all to remember that, you know, failure's not final. And maybe some of you Barnabases here, get to work, would you? There's plenty of work for you to do. And maybe if you can see and bring some of these ones and make them profitable, that would be good. And then we have this man, Jesus, or Joshua would have been a Hebrew name, called Justice. We'll call him Justice. He's also there too. These three, Aristarchus, Marcus, and Justice. I'm going to change the punctuation. I'm just maybe put a period after the full stop after Justice, 
and then a capital W on the who, and then take out the full stop after circumcision, maybe a comma or whatever. Who of the circumcision, these are, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. There's been a lot of Jewish brethren, and they've been nothing but a pain to Paul. But he says, these three, these three, they've been a real comfort to me. They're fellow workers. I take it that all three of them were Jewish. And then it's going to be another three names coming up that are going to be uh, Gentile names. But these three, he says, oh, what a comfort. They didn't just go the way of their culture, didn't go the way of the big names coming out of the Judaistic camp. He says, they've been a comfort to Paul. It's great to be a comfort to people, you know. Great to be a comfort. A lot of us can be like a prickly porcupine, but maybe we could just be more of a comfort. Do you know that actually people hurt? Have you, is it ever, do you, you know, people actually hurt? Do you know that preachers hurt? Yeah. They get hurt. They get insulted just as much as anyone else. And they don't have a special Teflon shield around them. They try to get the shield of faith up to get those flame and darts away. But one thing I've learned is that everyone has a hurt. Everyone has a hurt. Maybe your role will be the justice role. A comfort. A comfort. I'm trying to say this and emphasize it so that so some of you might just take that up as your little words. That this is what's being honored here, just being a comfort. Oh, we're so thankful for those who could just know how to comfort. And it'll take different, different experiences in your life. Will help you to be a comfort to others. And you've seen it as well as I do. Where you see at a funeral or at a graveside, and someone has lost their loved one. And we all do our best and put our hand on their shoulder and say, the God of comfort be with you. And, you know, we're praying for you and we're thinking of you and the lovely wife you had and this and that. And then along comes another man who has lost his wife in the last little while. He doesn't even have to say anything. He just puts his arm around him. He's a comfort because he knows. He knows. Maybe you're that comfort. Barnabas, the encourager. Justice, the comforter, along with these others. Epaphras. Look at Epaphras. He's one of them. He's actually one of the, he's one of the Colossians. In fact, he seems to have got saved somewhere. And in chapter one, verse seven, it seems that Epaphras has brought the gospel back to Colossae. And so he comes in. And he's one of them. It's a lovely expression here. He's a servant of Christ. He saluteth you. But you notice, it doesn't mention, oh yes, in chapter one, we have a little bit about maybe his preaching. He was a faithful minister of Christ. He declares things. Well, here it says he prays, laboring fervently for you in prayers. I was just telling someone the other day here that, uh, did I know brother so-and-so? I said, I did. Have I ever had a series with them? And have I ever worked with them? And I had to hesitate because there was someone who was very ill and both of us were summoned by family members to go and visit him. And I saw this brother and I knew he knew him, knew the sick man better. This man wasn't, he wasn't saved, the man lying in hospital. And so I said to Ivan, I said, Ivan, we're going to work together on this. When you go in, I pray. And I said, I'm not going to visit him at all. I am going to pray and pray and pray and support you and help you. And that he says, good. We knew time was running out. So as the story goes, he went in on the Friday and he, uh, he sat there and he talked with the family and they sat around the bed and they talked about this. Now, it's amazing how much you can talk about when the man's dying and he never got an opportunity, he sat there and he told me he left and he got out in the car and he thought, there's a man and I had no opportunity. Oh, well, I was trying to do my bit. Seemed like we weren't getting very far. 
We're praying and praying. Well, he got up the next Saturday morning. He says, visiting hours or no visiting hours. I'm going in again. And so he did. And the man looked at him from the bed, says, Ivan, you're back. If you've come back now after seeing me last night, you have something to say. And I want to hear it. And Ivan told that man right there that his need of salvation was never so great. He told him of the Savior. And he says, he told me later, Elton, I got real help just to lay it all out. He says, I'd barely been driven home before I got the call that he'd put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Because within hours he was gone. You know, you can labor together. Laboring fervently for you in prayers. Mr. Malcolm Radcliffe told me recently, he says, you know, maybe we should have done less preaching and more praying. I said, well, brother, you do the praying and I'll keep preaching. I said, you pray. There have been some mighty deliverances lately. 41-year-old consultant doctor. Delivered by God's grace in the seventh week. Told us in the ninth week, we kept on preaching. Didn't that? I wish they would tell us immediately, even a week in advance to encourage us, you know, to keep going. No, there have been some mighty cases. Prodigal sons come home. Never darkening the door of the gospel hall for years. And coming under tremendous conviction of the Holy Spirit. All because they were invited to a gospel meeting by a preacher who hadn't given up on them. And they said, no, I'm not coming. And he said, by the end of the week, he was in terrible conviction. That man has more interest in my soul than I do. I tell you, he was saved by the another three weeks. Reading a little gospel paper. at 5 a.m. sitting in the cab of his milk lorry. I tell you, brethren. Maybe some of you are going to labor fervently in prayers. That's what Epaphras did. He says, oh, he says, I want that assembly to be preserved. Preserved. More than that. Perfect. Complete. In all the will of God. I want them to be mature. I tell you, when Epaphras came for meetings, you would have known it. When he stood up to speak, you would have known it. All the love and the care and the passion, the great zeal he had, not only for them, he says, but over there in Laodicea and over there in Hierapolis, this triplet of certain cities, I call it tri-cities. And there they are, great zeal. What a man Epaphras is. Luke, the beloved physician. Well, the beloved physician, but he was also a dedicated chronicler of the greatness of Christ. Demas, Demas is doing well. Demas is doing well. He's with me. He's, he's with me, says Paul. He was not knowing there was a day coming when Demas was going to actually love this present world. He's going to leave him. I'm so glad that we have this here in Colossians. Just gives us, just gives us a little insight. We would have written Demas off as being no good. No, he was good. He was a tremendous help. This brings us a lot of sadness whenever we hear that Demas, when Demas has run off. Nymphus, well, I can't tell you if this is a man or a woman. I can't. Maybe you can tell me. Line up all your favorite translations, and some have it Nymphus, some have it a woman, some have it a man, and then some get around it and say, and the church which is in their house. So then I never know if it's a man or a woman. But whoever this person is, they must have been, maybe they were a people, person of means, I don't know. But they had a local assembly. How oh, can you imagine the annoyance that would be? Always having to move the living room furniture so that the assembly could meet. Oh, here we go. Oh, series. I'm going to have to move this dining room table every night and everything like that. Well, I know a lot in Japan. A number of places in Japan, I'm sure our brother Jack would be able to validate this, that you go to and one man, he's dedicated the first floor. That's where the saints will meet. Another man, he's got a special room. That's where the saints will meet. And it's, there's something precious about it. By the way, he doesn't have any more control over the assembly. It actually must be difficult for him not to stand up and say, hey, <clears throat> it's my house. 
It's not his house. Hey, oh yeah, the building's his house. But it's God's house. <laughs> the assembly's God's house. There's something lovely here that they can just salute the brethren and nymphs and the church which is in his, her, their house. And so that would be uh, just lovely. Must have been a harmony. This person must have been in harmony with the assembly. What if the assembly was to meet in your living room every week for the next year? Could they do it? Could they do it? Are you, are you in harmony with them? Or would they have to say, I wonder where he lives? Would they have to say, oh, I can't stand them? Would they, I don't know what they would have to say. But Paul had nothing but good to say. He says, you give them a salutation. Then he says to Archippus, this is our 11th person. Archippus, you've been given something from the Lord. Do it. I think, I think we've got plenty of Archippuses here. You've been given something from the Lord. You've been given a particular ministry. Take heed to it. You have received it in the Lord. Fulfill it. Every one of us. Uh, if I was sitting there in the assembly, you know, if Archippus was a young man, I would have been sitting there going, oh, yeah. You know how you just nod your head. Does anyone ever listen to the announcements? Well, yes. I mean, I do get them right eventually. But does anyone listen to the letters being read? Can you imagine how Archippus has felt as they stood up and they read this letter and they got all the way through it? And Archippus is just sitting there thinking about, well, I wonder what work's going to be like tomorrow morning. And I wonder how we can get on with things and whatever. And then all of a sudden he hears his name mentioned. Archippus, suddenly, he says, you take heed to the ministry you've been given. Oh, this is a bit uncomfortable. I don't think it was too critical. It might even have been to validate him in front of the others that he had a ministry. But could I just say to you in Perth, if you've been given a ministry to do, do it. My brother, my sister. Paul. Paul. He says, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Just that one word, Paul. I wonder what it would have done for the believers there. But he says, uh, I'm in prison. Suddenly all the greatness of Christ. Now we're just ending in prison. Remember my bonds. Remember my bonds. Suddenly, Paul seems incredibly human, doesn't he? He says, I'm stuck in my circumstances. Would you pray for me? If the apostle needed prayer, not only in his service, I think he needed prayer for his own heart and his feelings. He needed prayer for his emotions. He, he needed to just be remembered. Remember my bonds. He's not too great to ask for prayer. And then he ends with grace. I think that's most fitting because when the greatness of Christ, we've lived for the greatness of Christ and he in all of his glory, when he comes and rewards and calls us out one by one by name, has that private interview, I suggest, and they, maybe there's a crown that will be given and you would just step out. What are you going to be able to, to step out into eternity? You're always going to be with him. You're going to understand this, that it, is only according to the exceeding riches of his grace. And there will be that continually unfolding. Always great. But his grace. Because brethren, you're going to be there. And the wonder of it is, so will I. I'm going to be there. The son of God. In all of his glory, is actually going to have me with him. And he's going to have you with him. And we're going to bow our heads and admit it's all of grace. It was grace that first drew salvation's plan. And the gracious Savior executed it. And the God who is exceeding full of grace. Well, I just love that. There's something tremendous about the greatness of Christ. And because of grace, we're going to share in it. So what's the book of Colossians about? See, 
Colossians, complete in him.